Welcome to the What You Next podcast. In this podcast, your host, Lori Amin, will interview published authors to chat about their work, journey to getting published, and their book recommendations. If you share a passion for books and are always looking for your next read, then join us. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome to What You Next podcast. Hi. Thanks for having me. So happy to have you here. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, gosh. I, um, I don't even know where to begin. I was born and raised in Tennessee, and um, this for my entire life has just mo- been moving around. So um, I'm currently living in Los Angeles. Um, and I didn't start as a writer, like right away in my life. It was something that came after college. Um, and I had actually wanted to be a humor writer and didn't really know of anything about novel writing at the time. And I ended up being in the world of stand-up comedy for 10 years because I thought that was kind of how you became a humor writer. Mm -hmm. And after 10 years, I just had this realization that this is just going to keep going at, you know, in its own trajectory. Like it's, it's all about like getting more stage time and then becoming, um, going from somebody that's emceeing to, you know, somebody that's sort of the middle is what they call it. And then they end up being a headliner and then after that, you tour, and you know, it just has its own career track. And it, and then unless you're um, kind of staffed on a, a project where it requires like a TV writing thing, but it it's not really a direct path to being a writer who um, wants to write humor. Mm-hmm. And so after ten years of doing it, I just had this moment where I realized, oh, I don't think I'm on the right career track for me. And that's sort of how I ended up um, where I am now. So talk to us, how do you get started with stand-up comedy? Did you go to school? Like, did you take classes? Like, what was the process of that? I'm always curious. <laughs> it's, it was ac- an accident, to be honest. I, I was trying to figure out how to become a humor writer. So I Googled humor writing, stand-up, Oh, no, I uh, sorry. I um, googled humor writings and uh, Asian American, and one of the first hits that I got was a stand-up comic that was local to me. She was Korean American and lived in New York City, where I lived at the time. And so I actually um, emailed her and said, "Hey, I'd love to meet up for coffee or drinks or something and get to know like how you ended up becoming a humor writer." And when I met her, um, it turned out that her humor writing was stand-up comedy. And then she had other things listed on her website too. Like she was um, a performer and I said, Oh, what, what do you do? And she said, Oh, I perform stand-up. Oh, you, (laughs) you write. Oh, I write stand-up. And it it was all circling around her life, just being a stand-up comic. So after we were finished, I realized, oh, this probably wasn't the right match for me in terms of figuring out who I needed to speak with for this. But then she invited me along to her, um, she was on her way to doing a set. And I said, okay, well, um, yeah, I got nothing to do. I'll come tag along. And she performed and it was amazing because she did a five minute set. And it was all about her being um, a Korean American living in a small city in Seattle. And I could completely relate to her um, you know, on stage, uh, like stories and her punchlines, everything, just everything she said that came out of her mouth, I could relate to. And so could the audience. And that was the first time that I realized, oh, um, both Asians and non-Asians uh, appreciate her storytelling. And that's sort of how I ended up doing stand-up comedy. I ended up not actually um, like going a traditional path either. She had invited me later on uh, to be on one of her shows and um, said, you know, why don't you just try it out? And usually you you start off in the open mic circuit, um, mm-hmm. but I kind of jumped past that and then kind of went back to the um, open mic circuit because I felt like that was something I still needed to get used to, you know, the dead silence with other comics staring at you. And then them sort of, it's like a rite of passage when they, you know, laugh at your jokes and you know, like you've got a funny joke. So I I did need to get that validation. Um, But later on, uh, but that was later on. But when I was on her show, um, I performed five minutes. It was, there was a whole nightmare attached to that because I didn't actually know I was booked. I thought she was inviting me to the show. (laughs) 
but then she actually was like oh no you're on the show and that was like the day before and it was like the worst it was like one of those bad dreams you have where you luckily can wake up from and like oh I'm glad that was just a dream this was actually a real life thing where I was supposed to perform five minutes of stand-up comedy with one day of preparation uh with a total misunderstanding of what the situation was um but it went over well uh it, it, it was funny because after I finished, I was like, well, I'm not doing that ever again. <laughs> you know? And I'm leaving the com uh, comedy uh, comedy club and a stand-up comic who had, he was just really seasoned and he was a regular there. He was at the bar and he's like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? I saw your whole set. Um, is this your first time? And I was like, could you tell? And he actually said, you know, you have something there. It, you have a good like really good stories you just actually need jokes <laughs> and then but that was good feedback because I was just making people laugh through like the setup and whatever and just telling stories on stage because I didn't really have time to do anything else uh but he had said like oh you've got something there so that's that with that encouragement I was able to continue performing and and feel like I I could do it uh, and I'm glad I did stand up comedy before I did um, actually novel writing. I think it was a good um, foundation, good practice. Mm -hmm. And it also gave me a thick skin uh, when it comes to uh, feedback and things that I, I don't take things personally. Um, I, I may have 20, like 10 years ago, but uh, not so much now. So talk to us about the transition to novel writing, because you're writing why you're writing romance, like... Were you a reader? Were you a writer? Like, did you read craft books? Like, what was the transition to start writing novels? So when I was, when I had that realization that I needed to uh, transition away from stand-up comedy, I ended up just taking a lot of writing classes. And I think that actually through picking the wrong type of classes for me, it kind of ended up having me lead to where I ended up now. So um, I took uh, memoir classes. I took personal essays. I was sort of in the world of nonfiction, mainly because my standup was all about my real life and observations and things. So uh, it, it, it was kind of a natural transition to me, um, for me. And then when I moved here to LA, I ended up taking some classes at UCLA Extension for um, script writing. And again, I, I didn't know what I was doing either then. Um, and it was through just these exercises and writing um, projects and things that I kind of ended up figuring out that maybe fiction was something that I should also explore. It also came because um, the first, I would say the first book, quote unquote, that I finished was a collection of personal essays. And that was sort of a, a project that had started from one of my first classes. And it was uh, that I started querying that and I was getting good feedback from agents, but they had told me that, um, first of all, it's hard to sell personal essays now. And that was a few years ago um, because there is just not the right market for it anymore. It, it had a big boom and then it kind of tapered off pretty quickly. Um, and then she said, also, the only people whose essays and memoirs were selling are people who are famous. And so she said, so I just realized at that point, I could either switch to fiction writing or try to figure out how to be famous. So fiction writing seemed easier. <laughs> um, and so that's sort of how I ended up where I did. I was a, an avid reader when I was younger, and I was limited by um, just our, our financial means, but also whatever the library had to offer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, growing up in Tennessee for Korean American, there isn't a, a breadth of options when it comes to finding people who look like you and who have the same background as you. Um, so I, you know, I had only a few books to really choose from uh, that represented, like, that reflected who I was. Mm -hmm. And so um, it wasn't until after college that I was reading, um, you know, just actually books that were more literary. It was like uh, Amy Tan's um, Joy Lit Club, as well as, you um, Native Speaker by Chang Ray Lee. And um, it when I saw that um, Asian American stories could be put in literature, that's where it clicked, where I was thinking, oh, maybe I could do this. I hadn't even thought it was a possibility at the time. I love this. I love like how it's not linear. It's just stumble upon 
taking action, getting out of your comfort zone, doing it, and then be like, okay, not not really. Okay, let this one and just try this around, you know. So it's not a process of like it just happened one day. I wrote a book. And then, yeah, know. I mean that happens to people. I'm just not yeah. that lucky. <laughs> I'm yeah, the most but, unlucky person. So when I, it comes to that, it's just funny to see some people are like, oh, I wrote a book. I sent it to one agent. They took it. It went to auction. And now it's a movie. And you know, you're like, oh, I didn't go that path. I actually did a lot of other things before I ended up writing the books that are out now. <laughs> but I think it allows you to have like, you know, a breadth of, of experiences that are going to be reflective on your writing, like the humor, the sense of like, you know, maybe making it like representation because it wasn't there when you were growing up or like looking at different aspects of like, you know, I should be famous. And it's like, okay, maybe <laughs> like bringing that idea of famous into your books. Like, so all those different paths are leading to the novels you're writing. That's, that's exactly right. And the two adult books that I have written and uh, Loathe at First Sight was the one that came out last year. And the one that's coming out this year, So We Meet Again, they're workplace comedies. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have been able to really write them accurately, um, I feel, with the right uh, tension and the right conflict uh, that I wanted to uh, portray uh, if I hadn't been in these male-dominated workplaces myself. So I, I really do think that these things did happen for a reason. Um, hopefully it'll all be <laughs> future um, fodder for my books in the future. But um, yeah, I, I really do think that maybe my path was meant to be this way. All right. So let's chat about your books, the books that came out this year. So let's do first Sumi song. Um, what is the other word pitch and what do readers expect from this book? Sunny Song Will Never Be Famous is about a Korean American uh, teenager who is a social media influencer and she lives in Los Angeles and due to a online mishap, she, um, her parents sent her to a digital detox farm camp in Iowa. So she's a complete fish out of water taken to this camp that um, for the summer and she uh, obviously, well, she does not want to be there. And she ends up learning how to connect with people um, while disconnecting from technology. And so the whole thing is really about her um, figuring out what's important to her. And So We Meet Again is a book coming out in August. I'm very excited about this one too, because um, I, it takes place in Tennessee for the most part where I was, where I was born. And um, in this book, I try to focus on the themes of food and family and finding yourself and falling in love. Mm -hmm. And um, in this novel, uh, Jessica Kim, she's an investment banker on Wall Street and she's laid off on Zoom. And <laughs> she <laughs> is, she just, she ends up moving back home to her childhood, um, you know, hometown in Tennessee and lives with her parents and has to figure out what she wants to do career-wise. And she decides to um, revitalize her, um, a Korean YouTube channel um, cooking show that she had started when she was in college. And it's a, it's a channel that is about meal hacks where they take meal kits and then they hack them to make them more Koreanized. Mm -hmm. And while she's at home, she um, runs into her childhood nemesis. His name is Daniel Choi, who is the golden child and Mr. Perfect. And she realizes um, as she gets to know him that he's actually doesn't have the perfect life that she thought. Um, and so this book was, well, both books are written in the quarantine. So I, you know, at the beginning of the quarantine and through the whole entire year last year, um, and they do have themes that are kind of, um, reflected back into the book um, of, that kind of show what certain aspects of the quarantine life were, were like, uh, especially So We Meet Again, where um, she's, there's meal kits, you know, there's uh, a lot of, you know, that starts off with a Zoom call mm -hmm. and uh, she moves back home with her parents uh, to save money. There's just a lot of themes where I think people can relate to that book uh, especially now. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, the idea of like leaving New York and going back home. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. it's one of those people who love New York. I left right before quarantine, but it was like just the exodus of New York. Yeah, <laughs> right. And she has to give us this fancy apartment. She had just upgraded it yeah. um, and then has to end up losing her deposit, everything to go home. Uh, right. She And she has to figure out how to even be an adult in her childhood home. Yes, I think that's like a big struggle. So, oh, <laughs> so what was the process of writing during the quarantine? Was it any easier, any harder? Like, how did you balance both books, you know? Oh, I had trouble at the very beginning. Um, most, like most people, Mike, I just didn't have, I wasn't able to tap into the creative energy the first maybe month and a half. I didn't do any writing. It was mostly like, let me just try to do other things that are more, more admin work around writing versus um, like updating my website and things like that, that were kind of a little, didn't really involve creativity. Um, and then I think at some point, both editors uh, checked in, which was really nice of them just to see how things were going and if, um, you know, I need anything. And, and I think it was, probably after that maybe a, a week or two after they checked in that I was like let me just try and so Sunny Song the idea of it I already knew kind of how I wanted that to go so we meet again I'd actually conceived totally differently I wanted it to be originally and I pitched it this way as a um, as a book that took place in um, in a work environment so mm-hmm. she would be in Wall Street, you know, dealing with her day to day, the day to day toxicity, uh, um, sexism, sexism, and racism in Wall Street, and you would get to see what that was like. And she was going to get laid off, but you would get to see her in the workplace. But what I learned from, you know, as I was starting the book, is there was no workplace anymore, at least not last year. That the idea of an office setting, that sort of thing, all of a sudden became very foreign. And I didn't know if I could even write that book anymore, because I was like, do I really want to write this the way I had it? Because I don't know if it will be the same anymore, just the physical layout and everything. Um, So I looked at it differently thinking, what if it were more flashbacks of her work? So like she's, she gets laid off, she's thrown into her childhood world and then has to have flashbacks back to what it was like to work in finance. And that set up, ended up working out a lot better. And once I got over figuring out how to structure the book, it was easier to write. Um, I ended up just just writing a little bit every day and then ramped up when it was actually due. Uh, It's funny what deadlines will scare you into doing. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it was only like 200 words a day, 300 to 500. And then when it was crunch time, it was, uh, I think the maximum I could do is 1,200 words. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And that was like, you know, the last two weeks of just, you know, just crunch time. Um, But I luckily had ramped up to that. Some people can write a thousand words a day, 2000 words a day very easily, but not me. So I did need that ramp up time. So it was, it was like I had um, gotten some practice with those smaller, um, smaller chunks of word, uh, words that I needed to like do at the beginning. And I was like, oh, uh, this 200 to 200 to 300 words is about a a page on Microsoft Word, right? And Mm -hmm. I was able to do that, even if it was just a conversation. And so I think once I started building that up, it was easier. Um, But yeah, it was really hard to get that start. I'll be perfectly honest. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone who's like trying to create a project, I understand like, you know, just the manageable goals of just doing well, you have to do just build a muscle. So just start with like 100, 200, 300 words and not having to compare yourself with other people and other people's writing process. It's like, you know, you do you, you figure it out, it's going to work out, you know, the source yeah. of trouble, you know. And mm-hmm. so I love the fact that the story in some ways it's reflective of what 2020 looked like. You know, that's not this, you know, the idea like we were on a work, we were in office, like, you know, things have shifted radically. And I don't know what 2020 looks like because we're returning to work, but that's even that a lot of people are like, I don't want to go back to work, you know? Yeah. I don't want to yeah, go back to the office. Like the office. And I, 
workplace is like what is it gonna look like you know <laughs> and and it's not even figured out now so i uh i had a feeling that it was probably um just between it being sort of a a male dominated work environment and then on top of it being in this office setting it just would seem super like um distant or foreign or whatever yeah. for the reader so i just thought um just jumping into the story in a different place uh, mm -hmm. might work and luckily it did the other thing about writing in the pandemic was because i had two books and i'm not mm -hmm. a person who could juggle between the projects mm -hmm. um very easily i had to finish one before i could start the other just uh, that's just how my brain works so by the time i finished sunny song in um in the early summer I just jumped right into writing the next book. Um, and I'd already ramped up on the word count. So, um, you know, I had to dial it back a little bit because I was still trying to figure out how to start the book. But um, it was sort of like this consistent, it was like one big project, even though it was two books. That's incredible. So what is coming up next for you? What can we expect from you? What can you expect? I'm, I'm, I just finished a draft of this young adult book that uh i don't know if the title will stay the same but it's currently called you'll be sorry and it's a holiday rom-com yeah. and it's about i know I'm, I'm really now that i finished it i'm reading it back and i i was just so worried that it would just be like not like my other books in that um like i knew kind of how the other ones were kind of quick paced and um there were jokes and callbacks and and things like that that um, just made it very unique to me. And I just was worried that because this book was sort of written, um, you know, not in the same frenzy as the last two books, <laughs> that it would just have a different feel to it. But it does as I'm going back and revising it. Um, so I'm pleased with that. But there's a lot of work still to be done because it was a messy draft. I was like, wow, I have no description. Um, I have no subplots. <laughs> it's just like straight dialogue, just things happen and we get to the happy ending. So um, I'm definitely layering in a ton um, this go around. And it's, it, but it is nice that the structure is there. But this book is about um, two teenagers who work at two rival mall businesses. One is a photographer. Um, she's Korean American. She's a photographer at Santa's Village. And um, her rival is um, a guy, Peter Lee. He's Chinese American and he works at a virtual reality North Pole, you know, extravaganza. And they have very different good businesses, right? Um, and they find out that the mall is going to be closed. So they have to band together to save the mall. Um, the other kind of complication is that their parents also work at the mall. They both have restaurants in the food court. Uh, Chinese and a Korean restaurant, and they are mortal enemies. And so just to get everybody on board to try to save them all together is a huge task. And it's not going to be easy for the main character to kind of get things going. So it's it's been a lot of fun uh, to write. And um, it is weird, though, to write about the holiday season while it's summer. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that's the biggest part part that's hard for me is like I can't wrap my head around what like winter is like right now so uh, uh, that's another thing I have to layer in I was gonna say are you listening to Christmas music or like watching Hallmark <laughs> movies you know get in the holidays for <laughs> <laughs> I, luckily I'm reading a book right now that seems to be kind of in colder weather so I have to remember oh yeah they'll be wearing jackets and coats and that also it can be some of the description and you know so i yeah. i i think i'm i'm finally kind of getting to that point where i i can layer in some of the um secondary like these details that signal that it's winter time and yeah. um and then also i have a new scene that i thought of of course like after i've written the draft of like oh i should add the scene uh because it's a funny like holiday related scene that it, it can be kind of like a standalone thing but it still moves the plot forward so I'm uh, excited to write that. I just have to figure out where it should um, best be placed. Oh, this is so exciting. Um, so what has been a couple of books that you recommend our listeners to pick up? Like you have read or have heard about or anything related? Yeah, I've been lucky enough that um, I had this like good reading like experience where I was able to read just a bunch of books in a row 
And, you know, I'm a start and stopper when it comes to reading. Uh, sometimes I just don't read for like a few days to weeks and then other times I can binge it. And so I just had this huge binging session um, a few weeks ago. So I read Christina Lauren's uh, Soulmate Equation and just loved the nerdiness of it. Um, I mean, they're chemistry jokes. It's like hilarious to me. Uh, and it's just a wonderful story. Emily Henry's um, People We Meet on Vacation, I tore through that in a, less than a weekend. It was like a day and a half. Uh, and I'm a slow reader. So just for being able to plow through it was just, it's great. And it's full of banter and it's very lighthearted. And I really uh, thought that was a great read. Um, I was lucky enough to read Helen Huang's recent, um, the book that's coming out, The Heart Principle. Mm -hmm. um, it's different than her others in that it has just a different feel to it, but it's still just a wonderful book. And I know readers are going to love it. And I'm so lucky to have gotten that early read and uh, finished the rehearsals by Annette Christie. That's coming out actually next month. And that is a time loop love story. Um, it's a it's a lot of fun too. And I'm currently reading Alexa Martin's um, Mom Jeans and Other Mistakes. <laughs> the title alone is hilarious, but the first chapter just really pulled me in. It, it's about two, um, two childhood friends who end up later in life moving in together after a series of a life events um, kind of thrust them together um but they're good you know really good friends so it's it's neat to see like how friends friends and friendships evolve over like went from childhood to to current adulthood but most importantly i was just recently going through this disaster of a housing hunt and um the opening chapter starts with them signing leases and stuff and i was like oh my god i can relate to this book so she's a super voicey, fun writer, and I just really took to it. So I'm, I'm currently reading that now, but I don't know if I could put it down, but I need to because I need to finish these revisions. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love when that happens. You're like, oh, my gosh, I found a book that I can relate. That is like remind me of what my life is right now. And yet I have like other life responsibilities that I need to work on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a real testament to the the ability of these authors to write such compelling books. I, I like don't want to put any of them down. Um, so I had like a good run of like five books. And now I'll have to like put it down to finish this manuscript. And, um, and I alternate between kind of the rom com contemporary women's fiction, uh, romance books, and then I switch over sometimes to thrillers and mysteries, because I just like, um, fast-paced um kind of whodunit type books as well so um between those two I usually like flip-flop between like almost seasons like oh I feel like I'm in the mood for these types of books and I'll read like two or three of those yes I'm the same way right now I'm a thriller binge and I've been like and there's like so many good thrillers coming out that I'm like I'm enjoying this like whodunit murder just yeah like like let's figure it out like mind fog as opposed to be like okay let's think about like happy ever after endings you know you know it's funny in movies I always try to figure out who did it like it was like the whole thing I'm just trying to that's like my only goal is to like go what are the cues and let me try to figure it out in a book for some reason I don't really try as hard to figure out who it is maybe it's I'm enjoying the actual like page by page um, immersion and so when I find out who did it, I'm always like surprised. And I'm like the perfect reader for <laughs> mysteries and thrillers. And it's like, I wouldn't have seen this coming uh, at all. And it's it may be formulaic, but to me, it's just such a great experience uh, when I can get to the end and go, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about that person. But in a movie, I would totally just be looking at all the little cues and that person looks suspicious. And oh, that person, why are they here? You know, it, it's it's a different experience for me. And I love reading mysteries and thrillers. Yes, oh, I love it. Um, tell us where you can find me online. You can find me online on Twitter and Instagram at Suzanne Park, um, S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-P-A-R-K. Um, and on Facebook, I think it's Suzanne Park Comedy and at my website at SuzannePark.com. Awesome, thank you Suzanne for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, feel free to share with friends, subscribe, rate, and review the show.
This is the easiest way to support the podcast. For book recommendations, author interview archives, and other fun book resources and tips, please visit whatreadnextblog.com. The Watch Read Next podcast is part of the Frolic Network. To discover new shows to listen and love, please visit frolic.media slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.